Amen. Michaela, please give me some water and get that other cough drop from your mother and bring that to me, please. <clears throat> there was two of them. Maybe it's in my office. I'm not sure where the other one is. Um, please take a bulletin, if you will, and slide that in here in Revelation chapter number 13 and go to Psalm chapter number 91, not Psalm chapter number 71. So uh, real quickly, before I get into this evening's sermon, I'd like to add a thought to this morning's sermon there where I was going to conclude uh, today. So we... <clears throat> We went this morning through, uh, uh, it was the subject of, in a pandemic, how a Christian should respond. So we're asking or answering uh, the question, it would be, of how should a Christian respond in specifically the recent pandemic. Now, the world's response was fear. The world's was response, I'm sorry? I don't think so. No, it should be in there. Oh, you put it in my pocket. That's right. Yeah, okay, I have it. Just the water, please, then. So, how, what is the world's recent response to the pandemic? And, of course, it is fear. That is how the world has been responding. They've been responding through fear. Now, <clears throat> the world, as in those that are not saved, they have no hope. But we do have a hope. We have, of course, the hope. We have our hope in God. Our hope is the Lord Jesus Christ, which entereth into that which is within the veil. Amen. We have a hope. So we, we should not be fearful as they are fearful. You know, uh, we see everyone panicking. We see chaos. We see fright and confusion and fear everywhere. Uh, we see Christians all throughout the Bible we looked at this morning. They're commanded not to fear. Over and over again we see fear not. And what was the reason? Because God is our provider. God is our protector, right? Because God is with us. He promises that He will be there and even talks about He's going to hold us by our right hand while we go through while we go through the sea, while we go through the river, while we go through the fire. He's saying any tribulation, any problem, any trial, I'll be there with you. Therefore, fear not. So we as Christians, we should not fear. He is our strength. He is our refuge. Then we looked at, uh, you know, uh, extreme examples there. Psalm 46 talked about, you know, it literally described the world falling apart. And that's what we see today is chaos in the world, right? It looked like the world was falling apart. He said, what about if the, if, if the earth is removed and cast into the sea? He said, he's still going to, he's not going to fear, he's going to trust in the Lord. What about if the mountains were cast into the sea? He said, he's not going to fear, he's going to trust in the Lord. He talked about the seas are raging, still. What is his point? Even if the world is falling apart, and that's what it looks like today, we're still going to trust in the Lord. Even when, the, the, when, even when this world is falling apart, we're still planted on the rock, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's still solid for us. We looked at those severe situations there, but I also wanted to give you an, a, a, very precise, a very precise example and application to um, the virus. Because the coronavirus, not specifically by name, but the coronavirus, you could say that, is mentioned in the Bible. This exact a pandemic, which is a disease that is spreading throughout the world, a pestilence is what the Bible refers to it as, is mentioned in the Bible. And I want you to notice what the Bible says, how the Bible tells us as a Christian how we should respond in a pandemic. Look what the Bible says in Psalm chapter number 91, verse number 1. It says this, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom will I trust. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome, noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. Look at this. Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my, re my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. Therefore shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Amen. So notice over and over again he talks about don't be afraid, don't fear. In what situation? A pestilence. The pestilence that comes in the darkness. The, he talks about the noisome pestilence. Talks about, he's speaking about diseases. That's what he's talking about. 
He goes through all different sorts of scenarios all throughout the Bible, and in each and every one, none are different than the other. The most extreme example, the most minor example, do you know what we're going to do? We're going to trust in God and we're not going to be afraid. Amen. We are not going to fear you know, the things which the world are, is fearing. Why? Because we have hope. Because my God, He's the God of the pestilence. My God, He's the God of the coronavirus. He's the God of any plague, any disease. He, you know, there is no problem that is too big for my God. So this is why you know, we, we have the Bible for a reason, so that we can seek refuge and find hope and comfort in times of trouble. Do you know why? So that we don't fear. God doesn't want us to fear, and it doesn't matter what type of situation that it is. I'm going to change gears now. I want you to go back to Revelation chapter number 13. Revelation chapter number 13. This evening's sermon is going to be a very different sermon. I know I say that pretty often because uh, I'll preach different style sermons. And, uh, but this is going to be also very different than usual. Uh, I, I want to deal with some recent events of what's going on. And really the subject is going to be the New World Order in relation to this pandemic and how the current events that are taking place right now basically current events in light of the book of Revelation current events <clears throat> in light of the recent pandemic and how this pandemic is being utilized to bring about the new world order so as I said I'd like you to go back to Revelation chapter number 13 now we as Christians we have an advantage that non-Christians do not have and we have, what we have is we have the revelations of the Word of God. And more specifically in this case, we have the book of Revelation, which reveals to us the events that we are, gonna, that we are starting to see unfold and that we are going to see come to pass at one point. These <clears throat> revelations were given to us as a warning so that we can take heed. It's to show unto His servants things which must shortly come to pass. It's so that we are aware of what's going to happen and we can see it when it's coming and we can see it while it's unfolding so that we can be aware of what is going to happen. We are moving, <clears throat> I think this is the most appropriate way to refer to this, we are moving right now at breakneck speed towards the new world order and what the Bible refers to as the end of the world. Until recent years, you know, the, the, a lot of the events of the book of Revelation are really, they were, they were basically, they were, they were only, almost unfathomable. They were, they, were, they were impossible in a lot of ways. Now, for 2,000 years almost, <clears throat> the nation of Israel did not exist. The nation of Israel did not exist as far as being an established nation. Jews were just spread abroad throughout the entire world. The nation of Israel is necessary for the for the book of Revelation to even be initiated for it to even the events to begin but in you know, the 1940s what happened the nation of Israel was founded there are a lot of different things that are going to take place prophecies when the new world order is, is founded and the new world order uh, the new world government is implemented different monitoring systems the currency the mark of the beast, how they're going to be able to keep tabs on every single person everywhere, mark and register every single person. No one is even going to have the capability to buy and sell. That was not possible in the past. It was not possible until recent technologies that have been invented. The, 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 the monitoring that is described and how people are you know, uh, 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 tracked down and hunted, that's not po that wasn't possible in the past. Like like we see it happening today. These things, were you, they, you couldn't even have understood it to its full degree until, until we've seen technologies unfold recently now and it makes so much more sense. I want to say this, the, uh, the biggest obstacle is going to be a big portion of the sermon this evening. The biggest obstacle for the new world order and the global government right now. The biggest problem and biggest obstacle for them that's standing in their way, that's stopping all of the events from Re the book of Revelation from beginning, is the freedoms that exist in the United States of America today. That is the biggest obstacle for the new world order right now. There are a few other countries that possess the types of freedoms that we possess today, but the United States is the nation that sets the pace for the entire world of those that have freedom. 
you know we are the ones we set the tone and we are the influencer in many ways exemplary as being an example for them we're the verbal influence through ambassadors and things of that sort and then we're just just uh, uh, an influencer even through somewhat of being a bully in a lot of ways as well but you know military influence if you will but the United States and the freedoms that Western cultures and Western civilizations have today that is in a major way that is the biggest obstacle for the new world order that has to be removed entirely in order for the new world order to be implemented and globalists and elitists to be able to have their rule and their reign that is not possible with the freedoms that are in the United States of America today so what we can see today what we see through this 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 pandemic is we can see in a planned attack on the liberties that we possess here as United States citizens and this is not coincidental this is this is 100% strategic and it is very thought out they must remove and strip the rights of the United States citizens in order for the new world order to take place in order for the 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 uh, state of the world of which we say see in the book of revelation to be able to take uh, root and to grow and to flourish now i want you to look with me at revelation chapter number 13 because what we see here in revelation 13 is the new world order what is the new world order that people talk about i want you to look with me and we'll point out a couple of things about it begin in verse number one We'll see this, uh, this, this figure that is described here, this allegory, uh, allegorical picture. He says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now this is the beast. This is the Antichrist that we are seeing right now. And then he's called just that here in verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, that's the devil, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So notice that this beast has power. He has a seat, as in a seat of power. It's referring to a government, right? And then it says, in his great authority, just kind of restating the same thing there. It came from the devil. Look at verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. <clears throat> and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So this is the whole world ultimately worshipping Satan is the, the scene that we see here. And then it says, And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was power given unto him, a mouth, and there, I'm sorry, and there, was, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And power was given over him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So right there we see the one world government. We see a government where in this one man has a power, he has power, has a seat, and he has great authority where he is ruling over all kindred and nations and tongues. This is one government, one system of government where one man is ruling over the entire world. This is where we see a one world government actually in the Bible. Now look at verse number 8. <clears throat> and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Right there in verse number 8 we see one world religion. You've probably heard that talked about as well. Well this is all integrated into one system. This one world government is a, the one world religion. The man that is the head of this one world government is also the man that is being worshipped in the one world religion. We're also, you hear people talk about how, you know, there's going to be basically one economic system as well. One form of currency. That is talked about. Look at verse number 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So I want you to notice that this man has control over, he also has power and authority over the economic system. 
There's a one world economic system. There's one form of currency. He's controlling the money. He's controlling the financial system. And he is the one that's deciding who is buying and selling. Now, does that sound feasible just to implement that tomorrow? Does that sound feasible to implement a system such as that economically and just, let's say, in a week, in a month, in a year? If you were to look around the world today, what nation would you say would put up the biggest fight against something like this? And it's not just, you know, uh, uh, me being biased for any reason, but I would say that the United States of America would be the nation that would, you know, oppose to this even more so than any other nation. One reason being that our nation is primarily Christian. That's one reason. Number two is uh, the, the idea of liberty and freedom is deeply embedded into our nation because of our past history and our founding story. The record and the history of how our nation was founded, how we fought for liberty. Right? So. The, the, the United States, if we look around at the world today, if we see that there needs to be one country wherein the globalists, the elitists, the people that actually desire and want to have this one world government, if they needed to focus their efforts one place or another in order to get past the next hurdle or in order to move that landmark even further so that they can achieve their one world government, where do you think they're going to focus their, their attention? the United States of America. That's where they're going to focus their attention. Now I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 24 now. I want to look at some of the you know, uh, coming things, signs and stuff of the end times and and uh, you know you hear every prophecy preacher and prophecy you know uh, 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 enthusiast they love to just preach on the coming signs and you hear people all the time, the blood moons and and just like I talked about with giving of offerings a couple of weeks ago, what, ha what can happen all the time is these people can poison the water so that when somebody talks about coming signs, you know, they just kind of turn off immediately. What we need to focus on is what does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach on these subjects? And here in Matthew 24, it's the same reason why we have the book of Revelation. The disciples asked Jesus, what are, the, what are the signs of the end of the world? And you're coming. So we do have signs in the Bible of the end of the world. Of, uh, and that's what the Bible actually refers to it as, of you know, the time when the new world order is going to be implemented. We have signs and we can look to the Bible so that we can know when is this coming and what are some of the things that shall alert us and, 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 and that will give us red flags. I want you to look with me in Matthew chapter number 24 and uh, we'll look at, <coughs> we'll start in verse number 3. The Bible says, and, he, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, <coughs> the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The very first thing that we see that he mentions is wars and rumors of wars. So that's one sign. We're just going to look at these signs for just a moment. That's one of the signs of the end times, of the end of the world. And then he goes in in verse number 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So there he's repeating the wars and the rumors of wars. Then he says this. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. And then in verse number 8, he categorizes all this as, All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now if you compare this, and you can go ahead and go over to Revelation chapter number 16. If, um, 6, I'm sorry. Revelation chapter number 6. If you compare this with Revelation chapter number 6, this is where we find the seals. Uh, the seals that are mentioned. You have the seven seals of Revelation. And uh, those beginning of sorrows, they line up with the seals of Revelation. And specifically, they, run, they line up with the first four seals of Revelation. Those are the beginning of sorrows. The things we saw mentioned were wars, pestilences, famines, and in divers places, earthquakes. One of the seals is just death in general. And it's the death, the mass death, 
from the cause of these other three is what that is. People dying off from earthquakes, pestilences, and famines. Now pestilences is diseases. And I want you to notice it's interesting that it says pestilences and then it mentions the earthquakes as well. It says but in divers places. That means all around the world. Now specifically what the definition of a pandemic as I gave it to you this morning is it is a worldwide disease. You know what it is? Is it, It's a pestilence in divers places. That's exactly what the definition of a pandemic is. Now there has not been a, a pandemic that uh, you know that's projected to what we see now in many 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 years. Uh, many years. You can go through all of the past, the Ebola, H1N1, just every single one that in the past 30, 40 years, none of them were even close to this. They were contained, they were concentrated in small places, they never even reached where this particular pandemic has reached today. Not even close. So there is reason to become suspicious. There is reason now to open up our Bibles to start opening our eyes just based on the pandemic. Just based on that in, in, you know, in particular. But furthermore, I believe that there's something much more suspicious going on. You know, I believe that either this is a plandemic, if I, as I've heard some people say, that this was planned from the very beginning. At the very least, I believe that there, I know that, I'll say this even, I know that there was foreknowledge on the part of governmental societies and things along those lines. And I'm going to share with you something that I had found and, and I think I brought it up with some people just the other day. Very interesting. So on October the 18th in 2019 there was a meeting that took place. This meeting was the purpose was in preparation for a worldwide emergency pandemic that would possibly break out. It was to make sure that they were prepared. So preparation for a worldwide emergency pandemic and how would they respond. It was called Event 201. That's what it was referred to as, Event 201. It was referred to as a global pandemic exercise. Again, this meeting took place on October 18th, 2019. The event was ultimately publicized on November the 4th, 2019. Basically, the purpose was they were going to simulate a pandemic that was going to take place. They wanted to simulate this and then create this scenario. Then the Emergency Pandemic Response Board was going to decide what the best way to respond would be. Now, this was October the 18th, 2019. The board was comprised of, they said, highly experienced leaders. Now, I would say it was comprised of, you know, you know, uh, uh, the basically comprised of elitist and globalist and things along that line. Uh, those lines. I'll read some of them to you. You know, there's just just power hungry leaders basically, and even eugenicists, uh, and then governmental representatives. The people in attendance were the Bill Gates Foundation was there. There was a representative from the Bill Gates Foundation. Now, Bill Gates is the most open and public eugenicist that walks this earth. He is openly for population control and things along that line and no no surprise he is one of the biggest you know uh, uh, propagators of vaccinations and things along those lines as well. Uh, the World Bank Group was in attendance in this meeting. The uh, United States CDC, uh, Chinese CDC, so the CDC of China, the CDC of the US, the US Homeland Security was in uh, attendance NBC Universal, and then you probably guessed it, the UN was there as well. The United Nations was also in attendance where they were going to simulate a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, and uh, they had an emergency board made up of all of these different types of people. Now in this imaginary simulation that they just made up out of thin air, they just came up with this just to be their example, just imaginary, they just made it up, right? They just so happen to pick a disease as the threat specifically, right? Because it's a pandemic. Not only that, they just so happen to pick a, just an extremely highly contagious disease. And this highly contagious disease started in a foreign country. And remember, they're just making all of this up out of thin air. Just, this is just what's going to be their example. It starts in a foreign country, but then it spreads ultimately to the U.S., and it impacts the U.S. on a massive scale. Uh, that's what they're, they are going after. Now, 
What do you think that just randomly the name of this infectious disease is going to be? What disease would you guess? The coronavirus. They just so happened to choose that the coronavirus was going to be this highly infectious disease that was going to cause a pandemic. Not only that, because there are many different strains of the coronavirus, they said this is going to be a strain of the coronavirus that we have no vaccination for. Not only that, there are multiple strains of the coronavirus. Most of them are, are cold-like symptoms. This one particularly was going to cause flu-like symptoms and severe pneumonia. So they just made this up out of thin air, just randomly. This is just what we're going to, as a board, get together and discuss and see how we should respond. So that was on October the 18th that the board meeting took place. It was released on November... <coughs> November the 4th, <coughs> excuse me. Then, of course, in, as you know, December, towards the end of December, all of a sudden, there is a new strain of the coronavirus that is found that we don't have a vaccination for. It's highly contagious. Ends up becoming a pandemic where it's spreading throughout the entire world. It obviously started in a foreign country, and you know what it's doing? It's highly impacting the United States. So it's very, very detailed. Not just a couple of things similar. It's not you know, the, like the Simpsons episode where they're like straining at a gnat and, and swallowing a camel. It's extremely specific. One month after. Now that's just the details to begin with of how they you know, just basically laid the foundation for their scenario of this you know, uh, exercise or drill. So it spreads throughout the U.S. We see that happening. And, it's, and, and they said that it's going to uh, 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 basically affect the world in an unprecedented way in, any, you know, uh, in, in recent history. In this pandemic emergency response board meeting, they, 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 they pretty much just consulted with one another about the actions that they were going to take. And about what was going to take place when this, when this virus worsens throughout the world. These were some of the things that they said about the actions that they were going to take place and uh, how they were going to predict that this was going to happen. Number one, they wanted to global stockpile. They wanted a global stockpile of funds. So they wanted to have a centralized system, basically, where there's going to where the World Bank Group would be involved and finances and funds and money would be put into this global stock fund. So notice what the answer is immediately. It's a global answer. The way that we're going to get out of this is the whole world is going to come together and we're going to have this global government type system where we're get putting money into this global bank account. Number two, they said that they are going to place travel bans and restrictions. That that would be, you know, in this simulated type of system, they were going to place travel bans and restrictions. Number three, they were going to, of course, in, in relation to that, they were, going to, they were going to begin to start practicing quarantining people, mandatory quarantines. They are going to censor, censor speech and misinformation and false inf information. And one of the things is that the internet is going to be shut down. Um, one of the, the quotes was, the social media groups will need to realize that, they, that their moment of being a broadcaster is over. That was one of the statements that came directly out of one of the men's mouths on the board. They said that they were going to uh, um, enact martial law. That was another thing that they were going to enact was martial law. Uh, one of the quotes that came from one of the men's mouths that spoke about this said, we must treat this as though we are on a warlike footing. As in we are basically going to war. We need to treat this like we are going to war with this virus type threat. On a warlike footing. And then they also said that they are going to create global bridges to have global collaboration between all of these systems which branch together to this centralized system. So basically they needed to, do, to lay the train tracks so that they can network together a global-like system and the UN they established was going to be the centralized system that was going to be in charge of uh, 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 controlling, making the decisions on the logistics with everything. They were set up as the headquarters and then of course they were uh, 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 you know, uh, speaking with and employing some of the private businesses of the elite groups that were higher up and uh, you know, in, in that sense. 
So those were all the different things as far as how they were going to respond. Now, if we look at what happened in this catastrophe, in the pandemic, if you will, it's, you know, uh, to, to, to exaggerate it would be to call it a catastrophe. But what is going on right now with what is referred to as a pandemic in the United States of America and, and, and in every other country, what we see is exactly what they were predicting. We see travel bans and we see the restrictions. We see uh, uh, the censoring of speech. I don't know if you're aware of that, but there's many people. Some guy named Jim Baker has a massive following with two Ks. I'm not related to him at all. He has a massive following, some sort of like uh, a preacher, a Christian guy. I'm not exactly sure he is, but he, he has been totally like banned from Facebook and YouTube, I believe, because he's been putting out what they consider misinformation and false information. I know that there is real true discussion about, as they talked about in the meeting, cutting off the internet for a period of time, like 10 days or something like that. They, are true, they truly did uh, uh, consider doing this for private organizations, just cutting off the internet entirely. They practiced quarantining. That all took place. Now, this is in addition to the fact that their, that their uh, 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 experiment type drill that they ran took place a month before this pandemic actually occurred. And it was the exact disease. It was highly infectious. It was detailed about the disease. And it did exactly what they said. Now, their result was this. And this was the conclusion. It's, they said this at the end. The conclusion was it was catastrophic. They said that it, it caused uh, social breakdown, economic turmoil, and they projected that 65 million people died. 65 million people died. Now that was their projection. This was released way before anything that, that came out or anything that's taken place recently. This is called Event 201 is what this is referred to as. Then they gave their opinions on how we could have stopped this or lessened this. They said this. <clears throat> this is a direct quote. Did this need to be so bad? Could we have lessened the catastrophic consequences? And then this is the answer. And then they said, they said this. We believe the answer is yes. So are we ready? Are we as a global community ready. Notice that. So are we as a global community ready for the next pandemic? I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. So she makes the statement, are we as a global community ready for the next pandemic? Now, I don't believe personally that it is possible for anything like that statistically to have even taken place. For them to have, have just guessed they randomly assemble this board. They randomly choose out the exact disease. They give you the exact details of the disease, of what's going to take place, the actions that the government is actually going to choose and do in every single area. And then it just so happens a month later that a pandemic begins of the coronavirus with flu-like symptoms, with a severe pneumonia-like symptoms, spreads throughout the entire world. There's travel bans, there's restrictions. I don't buy it. I don't believe that they had no foreknowledge. I don't believe that this was not, at the very least, they knew of something that was going on. They knew that it was already spreading. They knew that something was happening. So in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, we find a, a very interesting verse. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. I want to talk about how this is affecting the United States of America. The very end of this sermon is going to be what is going to be applicable to us today. Uh, uh, very much so, and how we are going to respond. It's going to be the, uh, the addition to this morning's sermon, how we respond. Now, you're in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. I'd like to go over, and I was speaking with Brother Hall about this just previous to the sermon sitting down. I'd like to go over with you some of the possible and different achievements that the globalists will walk away with in this one single swipe in regards to their agenda of a one world government. Because there are many, many things, and I don't think that people are, are as aware as they should be of what is actually happening with this pandemic, and specifically in the United States of America, and what is really going on with this. 
Now, some of the things, I just want to read this off, and then I'd like to talk to you about, uh, uh, some of the, about the United States of America and what is actually going on as far as the executive orders. Now, what, some of the stuff that they could walk away with that I've heard that is, makes a lot of sense is, this is a, the perfect next step towards a cashless society. This would be the perfect next step towards a cashless society. The people of the United States, there's been polls taken of what they are most afraid of, and it is a pandemic. The, 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 what, what the, the United States is, <clears throat> have, have, uh, we've bred this attitude of like, we all have good sanitation, we live in a, the, a first world country, and we've gotten to the point where people are, are just, they're terrified of, of sicknesses and diseases, and they've become, a lot of people have went way too far with just being a clean freak. You know, they have the show, the stereotypical, I think it's Monk is what uh, Brother Hall and I were talking about, where this guy is like OCD and he's just, he's just, you know, this clean freak where he's afraid of everything. People exist like that because of the atmosphere and the environment that is in the United States of America. And the majority of people, their biggest fears today in the U.S. is some sort of disease or infection. That's what they're afraid of and that's what people are scared of. People would be more likely to go towards, to go to a cashless society with this pandemic. Why? Because money is one of the dirtiest things that exists in our society. Our money is disgusting. It's handled by everyone. And this is a fact. Obviously, it's very dirty. It, it's, it's, it's the most public thing that you pass around, cash that is. It's the most public thing that you, that you uh, uh, pass around and from one person to the next. You receive your money from you know, the, the cashier. You, know, you uh, uh, get your change back. You don't know if that person's got the flu. You have no idea if they have the coronavirus. But right now they have people so stinking afraid. Everybody is disgusted. You know, I have, you know, like I said this morning, allergies 2020, not COVID-19. I have allergies. And every time I cough, people are just whipping their heads and looking around at me. And, you know, it, you know specifically I had been working in a hospital for a little bit. And I'm trying not to let people see me cough and I'm trying to walk away. But anytime anybody sees me cough, I can immediately, I watch people over my shoulders. I see them in my peripheral, peripheral vision. If I'm looking at somebody, every time they try to get away from me. Or they, or they at least raise their head up and look over at me. People are terrified. People are, I mean, they are literally terrified anytime. You know how easy it would be to present to them, hey, do you know how dirty your money is? We can prevent, we can take a major step in prevention of spreading this disease if we just go to a cashless society. Everybody uses cards anyways. Why not just get rid of all the cash? All the cash. Now why, is, why does that matter so much? Because ultimately there's going to be a one world economic system where there's going to be a man in charge that's able to have control over this entire system. Now with just bi dollar bills floating around that makes it almost impossible. But you know what makes it a lot easier? If everybody had a card. I think it would be a lot easier if that card got implanted in your right hand or your forehead. But, you know, we got to do baby steps here. If, if everybody just had a card, if everything became electronic, to where it's just, you just, <coughs> everything's in your bank account, you just slide your card. You just slide your card and that's all that you got to do. So this is the perfect system or the perfect uh, 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 type of scenario, number one, for taking steps towards a cashless society with this pandemic, specifically the pandemic, a virus that is worldwide affecting the whole world. Number two, uh, uh, the steps towards the one form of currency. This obviously kind of ties in with one another. Steps towards a, a one, one form of currency. Number three, mandatory vaccinations. Mandatory vaccinations. Now, <coughs> this is a big thing for people in the United States. You know, uh, this would be a perfect way. This would tie in with depopulation, with population control, as people talk about. This is a big thing that elitists are interested in. You know, uh, uh, the Georgia Guidestones, of course, mentions this. A lot of the higher-ups, they want to. Ted Turner and all these people that have power, they have openly and publicly stated that they want to lower the population of the world. This is a perfect opportunity with mandatory, mandating vaccinations. This would be, right now, if any, if any time in history, in the past 20, 30 years, if, if, if there was a time when people were more willing to go for mandatory vaccinations, when do you think it would be?
What if tomorrow somebody came out and said, we've tested it, it's safe, and it, and it cures the coronavirus? How do you think people would respond? They'd say, give it to me first. Brother Hall and I, when we were out soul winning today, there were two doors right in a row where people answered. They came to the door. They didn't open the front door. They came in through the porch and they spoke to Brother Hall both times th through their fenced-in porch. And their demeanor, their uh, uh, just expressions, everything about it. And even one person, the woman, even just said, I'm terrified, didn't she? And it was obvious she was terrified. Even the man that opened the door. You could tell he was trying to play it off. But he came out the door and you could just tell this guy was, was terrified. People right now, if there was any time when people would be willing to take a mandatory vaccination or to go along with anything, it's during this pandemic. <clears throat> Obviously the train tracks are being laid to create the necessary network for the global network, the global one world government. Uh, everything that has to go with that. Do you know what people are doing is right now is the perfect time for people to, what, the, what it is is they, they are developing uh, 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 pe for people to have blind faith in government. That's what they're doing. They are conditioning people to have blind faith in their government. And then the last point that I want to focus on here for a few minutes is the liberties in America. The liberties in America and also of course around the world have been infringed like they've never been in recent history, in, the, in, the, in these nations' history, ever. Dur but during this, like they have during this pandemic. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 17 says this. You're probably familiar with this verse. It says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. I believe in the United States of America, in the founding of our, na our nation, that the Spirit of the Lord was here. I believe that. I believe that this was a godly nation. I believe that it was a Christian nation in the sense that I believe that there were many people, many of the nation's citizens that were Christians and that served the Lord. There were many true born-again believers that loved God. And I believe that that's why we had liberty. If you look at the liberty that this nation was given and that this nation had. If you look and read about the nation of Israel, there was much liberty in the nation of Israel. They could do almost anything. People think, oh, it's just all these laws. The United States of America today has so many more laws than what they had under the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. You know, they, they had true freedom. Yeah, they weren't able to kill anybody or rape anybody or commit adultery or kidnap anybody. There, there wasn't hardly any rules at all. That was, that was basically it. I just named off, you know, you know, uh, uh, probably a fifth of all the laws that they had. They had almost no laws in, in the nation of Israel. And that's how the nation of the United States was. We had righteous laws that were based upon the Bible. Not every single sin when our nation was founded was illegal. That's not how God operates. He gives man free will. But when, he, when, it, when something is illegal and, and, it's, and, and there's legislation against it, is when you start violating other people in most cases. Or in the, in the nation of Israel, of course, if they were to sin against the Lord in a major way, sometimes they would be punished. But there wasn't laws against every little thing. That's how the United States of America was in its founding. And throughout time, those liberties have been chipped away at slowly. Just slowly chipped away at where people are just slowly getting acclimated to losing their, their liberties. Now, <clears throat> some of the things that have taken place recently in the United States of America that people need to wake up to and they need to realize that this is not normal. And this is, this is, some of these things have never happened in our nation's history ever. Not even close ever. Certain executive orders that have been, that have been uh, uh, mandated. Number one, the travel bans. Restrictions on being allowed to travel. Travel bans and restrictions. That has never happened in our nation's history. Now, that is, you know, one of the rights that we have as United States citizens. The right to freely travel to and fro and not to be molested. That is one of our rights as a United States citizen. Um, you know, we have the, the banning of assemblies. This is the worst of all of them. 
where there are executive orders on state levels that are banning assemblies. Now, these are different types of assemblies that, that, that they're banning. You know, uh, uh, just for people, you know, some states, they started off, I believe North Carolina was the first one with 250 people. Uh, 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 if you have more than 250 people, they're not allowed to gather together. No more than 250 people. They put a ban on that. Then, you know, then they went down to 100, 50, 10, and all, other all of the other states have, you know, followed in a very similar order. Some states have just now, I know Kentucky's one of them, Ohio, Illinois, California, New York. They've totally just banned any sort of assembly. They've shut down private businesses. In some states they've said, oh, like our state right now, no public uh, um, um, dining in, in the restaurants. You can just, just carry out or delivery only, right? <clears throat> A lot of bars and stuff, they've completely shut down. Public places, they've completely shut down, 100%. That is obviously one of our rights in the Bill of Rights. And many people in the United States of America, they don't understand their rights and their liberties. And they're very confused about this. And they think, and what they think is this. They think, oh, well, because this is a serious crisis, because this is a massive crisis or a pandemic, well, that is an exception. But that's not how liberties work in the United States of America. That's not how liberties work in general. The, the Constitution is not where we received our rights in the first place. The Constitution is not what gave you your rights. When those were right, written down on paper and signed, it's not like you got these rights all of a sudden, guys. You know, feel free to say whatever you feel like saying and go wherever you feel like going. That's not how this works. The, 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 the Bill of Rights was just the declaration of rights that we already had. And the Constitution itself tells you about these rights in regards to that specifically, that they are inalienable rights that we were endowed by from our Creator. Our Creator is who gave us these rights. Government did not give us these rights in the Constitution, nor did the Bill of Rights give us these rights. We have these rights, according to the Constitution, we have these rights from God. God gave us these rights. We have the right of liberty, of free will is what it is. To do what we want. To say what we want. These are rights. This is what the United States believed in. And because our nation is becoming more atheistic, and because our nation is turning from God, we shouldn't be surprised that we are, at the same time, losing our liberties. You shouldn't be surprised that when the Spirit of the Lord is walking out the door, your liberties are holding, are, you know, is right there with Him walking out the door. They, they go hand in hand. So because our nation today is coming to a point where the people of our nation, it was never had to do with our leaders at all, but that the people have rejected God and turned from God, do you know what they're going to lose? Well, with the Spirit of the Lord comes liberty. So when the Spirit of the Lord leaves, you're going to lose your liberty as well. And what happened is, right now people are just totally unaware about their rights. So many of them. They have no idea. They don't understand it. And everybody's like, well, it's a pandemic. It's understandable because it's a pandemic. You, you don't get that, that the government is way outside of their bounds. That is not what they are intended for at all, ever. That was never their job. And when they get their hands on stuff, they mess it up. They're not going to help a situation like this. They're going to hurt it. Private organizations is what would fix this. Private organizations coming together and putting their heads together is what would fix a situation like this. This is how, uh, that's how a situation would be fixed. The banning of assemblies. They are literally telling churches that they cannot meet. Think about that for a minute. They are saying that you cannot go to church. Oh, it's just the situation. I don't give a rip whether it's a pandemic I don't give a rip what it is. I don't care the situation. They are telling churches you can't meet. You can't come together. Who would have ever dreamed, and I don't care what the situation is, who in here would have ever dreamed that that would happen in your lifetime? Where an executive order would be signed saying no churches can meet. It doesn't matter the situation. My rights are not temporarily suspended because there's a disease going around. Where I can't go to church. And you can prevent me and stop me from going to church. That's not how this works. And, but people are just going along with it. <coughs> They're just going along with it. They're banning free speech, of course, too. You can't say whatever you want to say. Now, when your rights are infringed upon, what happens is 
They, they always, when, what people do is they get, when they are willing, let me word it this way, when they are willing to give up their rights, it's always, every time when someone is willing to give up their rights, it is in place of security. Every time. Now, there's, I, there's only two ways they can take rights that you have away. They can either, either do it physically or they can coerce you into doing it and kind of manipulate you into doing it. So they can, they can overtake you and take away your rights or they can manipulate you. They can, they can get you to give your rights up. Now, who in their right mind is just going to say, yeah, I don't want freedom. Take it. Enslave me. Who would do that? No one. No one's just going to freely give up liberty and right to be able to go to church and things like that. So what do they have to do? The only time when people are willing to give up their rights, the only time, is when they are afraid. Fear. Fear. When people are fearful, that's when they are willing to give up their rights. And do you know why they give up their rights? For security. This is, this, this is a very fundamental fact. Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin made the statement, I thought I had it down here, but Benjamin Franklin made a statement along the lines of the man who is willing to give up his liberty for security receives neither. Because obviously once you give up your liberty for security, now you're enslaved to the person who's supposedly securing you. So you don't have liberty obviously and they're not going to keep they're not going to keep you safe because they don't really truly care about you. They're just taking advantage of you. There is, no, there is no government that cares about you. Let me just bust your little bubble there. But uh, here's the thing. Do you know what he understood? The point of that is this. What does a man give his liberty up for? Security. Always. The only way in which people give up their liberty is for security. Why would someone desire security so badly? Because they're afraid. Because they're fearful. Because they're scared. Do you know what people are most scared of in the United States of America today? Diseases. Infections. That's what people are afraid of. That's what people are scared of today. So you know what they have to do? Is at the very least, they ha I believe that they had foreknowledge of this pandemic that took place. But you know what they have to do is, <coughs> once it arises, once it begins to spread, they exploit these types of crisis for political advantage or for political agendas. And they take advantage of them. And what they do is they, they, they at that point, they begin to use the media as their manipulation tool to cause fear and to, and to instill fear into the hearts of the citizens of the United States. And, and, and let me ask you this. Is the media right now, do you think that they are... <clears throat> Do you think that they are portraying positive news or negative news right now? When, when you, it's, it's how bad is it? Horribly bad, isn't it? When you go out and you go out into the grocery stores, what's the response of people? What's, the, what's people's disposition right now? Fear. Where is it coming from? You've got to stop and think, why is everyone afraid? Why is every single person afraid? Someone is doing that. Someone is desiring to have them that way. Someone wants those people afraid. Why? Because they wouldn't be willing to go along with, you're not allowed to go to church unless they were afraid. They wouldn't be willing to go along with, you got to be quarantined for two weeks unless they were afraid. They wouldn't be willing to go along with, no, no traveling, traveling restrictions, travel bans, unless they were what? Afraid. This was literally the perfect tool. It was that which was the only thing that would have caused people in the United States of America to be able to just freely relinquish their liberties. And that's exactly what took place in this situation. So over time they were just chipping away with a 16 ounce hammer at our liberties. And you know what happened here with this pandemic? They basically pulled out an axe. Once your rights are infringed upon one time, now that California has been told you're not allowed to go to church anymore, how much easier is it for the state of California to say that again in a year? How much easier, how hard is it to do it the first time? Once you do it once, you know how easy it is to do it again? 
Now that they've, now that they've moved that, that liberty, they've, they've, they've attacked all of these different rights that we possess in the United States of America, how easy is it for them to be able to change and move around and revoke and, and do all different types with the liberties and the rights that we have today in the United States of America? Next time, it's not, it may not be a pandemic. It might just be a little, a little bit less of a situation. But you know what they'll be able to do easily? Enact the same thing again. If they, if they end up, like they said they were going to do, employing martial law, it's not going to be unprecedented. So you know how, you know how you know what next time what's going to be easy to do? Release martial law again at any time that they want. <clears throat> when, when rights are taken away and for the supposed protection and because of a threat, what happens is you're not given those rights back once that threat is gone. They still, they just keep those rights from you. So what's going on right now in the United States of America is the New World Order globalists and elitists that really exist in real people. Why? Because the Bible says that there are, there are evil people, spiritual wickedness in high places, men that are trying to, to bring about this one world government. They've, they've said it out of their own mouth. There's many uh, different statements that they've made. There are real people that want to do this. Real people that want to do this. And what, what is going on right now in the United States of America is they are at the very least taking advantage of this crisis and this pandemic for their political agendas and their political purposes to bring about the one world government. That is the reason of what's going on right now. And people in the United States of America need to wake up. They're just walking around. They're as blind as can be. And do you know what they are? They are, every last one of them are terrified. They are terrified. <clears throat> and they're viewing everyone as an enemy, as a, as a possible carrier of this, of this deadly virus. You know, they, the, the, this virus is like the worst boogeyman in the world to these people. Everyone is just so terrified of coronavirus. We're not even able to say, we're not even allowed to say the words coronavirus in the hospital that I work in right now. Everyone has been instructed, do not use the statement or the word coronavirus or COVID-19. Do not say that. Why? Because people are just panicked. Don't talk about it. This is, this is on purpose. People are like this on purpose. Why? Because people are easier to manipulate and to, and to use and to, get, and to, and to uh, 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 take advantage of when they're afraid. Because it makes you vulnerable. That is what's going on right now. That is where this is leading. I personally, I believe that it is very, very possible. More so than I've ever thought this in my life. And I, and people that know me well know that I'm not like, I'm not, to be honest, my, a lot of people like, hey, my favorite book is Book of Revelation. My wife's like that. A lot of people are like, end times Bible prophecy is my favorite subject. Anybody who knows me knows that that is not how I am. I'm not crazy about end times Bible prophecy. And a lot of times people, when they're super interested in end times Bible prophecy, they're constantly trying to tie current events in with end times Bible prophecy. I don't do that. And I don't sit around and talk about how this is bringing about the one world government. I'm sure everybody who hears my preaching knows that I don't focus on that very much at all, do I? No. I'm not obsessed with that. I believe that the tribulation is coming soon. I think, I personally believe that it is truly coming soon. Everything is like falling into place. The moves that people are making around the world today fall in line exactly with what we need to happen in the book of Revelation. And it was precisely predicted in a very specific way and how everything was going to happen, the pestilences, all of these types of things. I truly believe that it is going to come soon. I, I way more confident now ever in my, in, in my life I believe truly that it is going to happen in my lifetime strongly. So the question is, what do you do? And this brings us back to this morning's sermon. What do we do? Go to Revelation chapter number 14. What do we do? <coughs> now a lot of people that are, <coughs> that are Christians, a, a lot of their answers, and I dealt with that a little bit this morning, is we got to prep, we got to buy all these supplies, we got we to get all these different things. And I'm not totally against that. You know, I went out and 
bought my fair share of ramen noodles and things like that the other day. I got all kinds of these, you know, non-perishable items that are going to get us by. You know, and to be honest, I don't mind eating ramen noodles, so I'm maybe looking forward to a two-week quarantine. But I'm, you know, I went out and I also I you know, took part in getting some non-perishable items to stock up. So it's not, it's wise to get some items to get you by. It's wise to, to kind of like, if you see, <coughs> you know, something bad coming, to prepare for it. You know, that's wise to do what you can do. But let me tell you this, ultimately, you are not, it is not going to be you that gets you through the hard time or gets you through the tribulation. Right. I want you to look at Revelation chapter number 13. <coughs> Revelation chapter number 14, I'm sorry. Revelation chapter number 14. Look with me at verse number... Um, it, is, it is chapter number 13. Sorry about that. Um, Revelation chapter number 13. It says in verse number 10, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. You know, and then it says, He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. It's just talking about those that make it through the tribulation. It makes this statement. It says, Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. I want you to flip over to Revelation chapter number 12, 12 now as well. Revelation chapter number 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 12. <coughs> we need to have faith. When it specifically mentions those that are going through the tribulation, it says, here is the faith, here is the faith and the patience of the saints. So what was it that was getting them through the tribulation there? What was mentioned specifically? Faith. We're told about those specifically in prophecy that are going to make it through the tribulation. What are they going to have? What did we talk about this morning? Faith. Faith. This is something that is obviously harped on a lot. It's something that we hear so much that you kind of forget about the importance of it. Faith is what is ultimately going to get you through the tribulation. Faith in God because God is the one that's going to carry you through the tribulation. Revelation chapter number 12 has to do with the prepping. You know, how much prepping should we do? How much should we have? The Bible is very clear that there's going to be a time of famine and everything that you're going to be able to ride through until you get to what is called the Great Tribulation. And when the Great Tribulation happens, that is when persecution actually is aimed at Christians, where now Christians are being hunted down. You can't buy or sell. And he is, he is trying to find Christians in order to... He is hunting down Christians, that is the Antichrist, in order to kill them. So this is when the persecution of saints begins... Uh, uh, fully, and this is the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Right when the Great Tribulation starts, that's what initiates it. And you are not going to be, you know, uh, 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 carrying your your supplies with you. That's not what is uh, um, described in the end times with, uh, um, you know, uh, the Christians. Look at Revelation chapter number twelve. I want you to look at how it describes this. Look at verse number twelve. It says this: Therefore, rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of, as of a great, or I'm sorry, two wings of a great eagle. It's referring to the saints here and the Christians that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place. And then it says this where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. This is the persecution that's going after the Christians. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Now, of course, the earth helped the woman how? The Lord, of course, is the one that's, that is helping them. It also said in verse number 14 that, that the woman had two wings like a great eagle. And notice where she goes. It says that she flies into the wilderness, into her place. So she has a place here where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Who is nourishing her? Now, this is very strong, strongly paralleled with a situation in the Old Testament with Elijah. Elijah the prophet. 
where there was persecution of the prophets and the saints from Jezebel, the great whore. And Jezebel, the great whore, was persecuting the prophets and the saints and trying to kill everyone. And Elijah went out into the wilderness. And do you know how long that persecution went on and that drought and famine went on? A time and time and half a time. Exactly. Three and a half years. Now at that time, he was being nourished by who? By the ravens. And the ravens were being, of course, called by God. They were being sent and called by the Lord. So ultimately, Elijah was being nourished by the Lord. God was the one that was providing for Elijah. So we see that reference to that same type of situation that occurred with Elijah. There's also another scenario that is spoken of with Elijah where all the prophets are, are taken by Obadiah and put into a cave somewhere. And Obadiah is just going back and he's feeding them food and bringing them food. So in that type of scenario. But you know where they're located, all of them? They're all out in the wilderness. They're all out in the wilderness. They're not staying at their house. They're not staying at their bunker. They're not using all of their supplies. They have somebody else bringing them food. They have a messenger bringing them food. They have somebody that's, that's, that's caring for them. And here we actually have a breakdown of how those that are going to make it through the, the tribulation, how they're going to get through it. And it's not because of their prepping. Not to say that any kind of preparation is horrible. You can do what you can do. But the point is this. Ultimately, you're going to be leaving it behind anyways. Ultimately, do you know who's going to make it through the tribulation? It's going to be those that have faith and patience in God. It's going to be those that are keeping the commandments of the Lord. Go to Luke chapter number 21. So we should have faith in God. We should trust in the Lord. We should keep His commandments. That's, you know, uh, it refers to having patience and enduring. That's what that means. And then there's another thing here in Luke chapter number 21 where it's speaking of end times. What else should you do in this type of situation? Luke chapter number 21 verse number 36 here at the end. <clears throat> He gets done explaining all of this and he says this, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now that is a very, very powerful verse because it is the only specific verse that addresses information that you would need on how to get through it. Now, we can read and we can derive these things from the book of Revelation. But this is the only verse. It's not found in Matthew and it's not found in Mark. It's only found in the book of Luke. It is, you don't have a statement like it, this in the book of Revelation where God says, Hey, you want to get through the tribulation? This is what you need to do. But in Luke chapter number 21, verse number 36, you have Jesus speaking to you. And after he explains the tribulation and everything that's going to take place, he says this. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. Number one, according to this verse, you need to watch. Watch what? It means you need to be paying attention. You know what that means? You need to be familiar with your Bible. That's what that means. How could you watch if you didn't know what to watch for? He just got done telling them the signs. You know what you need to be familiar with is you need to be familiar with your Bible. You need to be familiar with the end times, the end times events. You need to be familiar with the, the things that are coming. See, and you need to be watching. You need to be alert. You need to be awake. You need to be aware of what's going on and vigilant. Watch. But then also, something that Christians lack drastically. And if you were to tell me where you lack in your Christian life the most, it's probably in this area. Prayer. That's something that we don't spend a lot of time on today as, as you know, New Testament American Christians. You probably read your Bible on a more consistent level than you do praying. You probably do a lot of things. Probably go to church more religiously than you do, you know, no pun intended, pray. But of the things that are mentioned when God says, Hey, you want to make it through the tribulation? This is what you need to do? He says two things. Watch and pray. Do you know why prayer is so important? 
because ultimately he's going to be the one that gets you through it. You know what's going to you know the people that are going to survive it's not going to be because you have 75 days worth of ramen noodles. That's not why you're going to make it through. It's not going to be because your survival skills because you know how to build a fire. That's not what's going to get you through this. I'm not saying you shouldn't know how to build a fire. But what I'm saying is this, your trust better be in the Lord to get you through the tribulation. You better be depending on God to get you through the tribulation. And it'd be, right now, it'd be a scary time to be out of church, not going to church, and not you know, serving God. And to be backsliding in your Christianity. That, this would be a scary time to be in that place in your life right now. This is the time where people need to be getting strong in their Christianity. Where they need to be taking it very, very, very seriously. And they need to be aware of what's going on. What do we need to do? We need to have faith in God, number one. That's what we need to be doing. It mentions the faith and the patience of the saints of those that get through the tribulation. Specifically, uh, there was another passage that's paralleled with that that talks about the commandments. Because patience actually means enduring. So it's the faith and the commandments. Not everyone makes it through the tribulation. Many people are, 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 are put to death and martyred during the tribulation. Furthermore, we need to be watching for the Lord and paying attention to things. And we need to be praying to God. Now that may seem like, man, that doesn't feel like very good advice. Well, take that up with Jesus, not me. Because Jesus is the one that said, watch and pray. Therefore, watch and pray if you want to be, if you want to be accounted worthy to make it through the tribulation. That's Jesus' words. So you know what you need? To, what I would personally start doing, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start taking my prayer life a lot more serious. Amen. Start praying to God. Because if here's the thing. There's a, a real principle in the Bible that God says He does not answer prayers unless you pray for Him. I'm going to pray to God the more I see these events unfolding that He is going to count me worthy. That He would allow me to make it through the tribulation. And how great would that be at the end of the tribulation? I feel real bad for these Christians that think that there's this rapture that's taking place before the tribulation starts. How confused and dazed would you be when all of a sudden you hear about some guy declaring himself to be God in a temple in Jerusalem? You would not be prepared and aware. You would not be ready. You would not be watching. Let me say that. But how great would it truly be if the events of Revelation, if the Bible really came to life in our generation? And the events of Revelation really started unfolding in our lives. We start seeing one event happen and then the next event happens and you're still kind of hesitant and then all of a sudden, the next event takes place. And it just continues like a domino effect. I mean, obviously, there's the, there's the element of fear, but there's also a big element of excitement. Amen. I really believe this book. And, and these events are going to happen at one time or another. And I'll tell you this, it sure looks like it's getting ready to happen in my lifetime. Truly. It really looks like it's getting ready to unfold very soon, very shortly. Now, I'm not, you know, we're not up here setting dates and things like that. We don't do that. That's ridiculous. But I'm telling you that we need to be aware. We need to be watching. We need to be praying. We need to be strengthening our Christianity. Hey, maybe it's not going to happen. But I'd rather be alert and awake and ready just in case it did. Because I know that it's going to. And you know, just like the Bible says, how great would it be if we did keep faith, we did keep the commandments, we did watch and we did pray and we were counted worthy. And like the Bible says, lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. And our feet are planted on this earth when Jesus Christ himself comes back in the clouds. Amen. What a glorious moment that would be, especially after going through the pains and the sorrows of the tribulation. So here's the thing. We need to be awake. We need to be alert. We need to be looking around at the United States of America today and truly seeing the conditions of what's taking place. Because... This pandemic, there's a lot of real eerie, suspicious, weird things that are going on right now in the world. Just strange stuff that's going on. That event 201 and many other things that I've seen, and I'm not this big, huge conspiracy theorist. I don't spend a lot of time on that kind of stuff. I don't put a lot of stock in it. I believe there are real conspiracies. The Bible teaches conspiracies. And I don't spend a lot of time on that, but there are a lot of weird things going on right now. A lot of strange things. And what we're starting to see is you have the prophecies of the book of Revelation. You have a lot of these things just falling into place one after the next. 
Very oddly and eerily, just, just very detailed. One thing after the next. And a lot of people are asleep right now in the United States of America, which should be the bastion of Christianity. And you know what's going on is, liberty's being taken away because the Spirit of the Lord is not here, by and large. We need to pray that we might be counted worthy, that we might be of that remnant. Even if it is truly, you know, our nation has become this godless, atheistic nation on a level that we just don't truly understand today, we need to be praying and taking our own personal <coughs> Christianity very seriously. Amen. The Bible talks about in the end times how the Christians that lived during that time and the saints, how they're going to do great exploits. I want that to be talking about me. Amen. That's talking about real Christians that are really going to walk this earth. Real people that's prophesied about. I want that to be about me. I want to strengthen my Christianity during this time period. I want to be ready for this. I want to do more during this time period. During the I want to be a part of a Bible story. This is exciting to me. I don't know how it is for you, but this is exciting to me. I read about the stories in the Bible. They're amazing. You know, I truly believe that those things happened. I have faith in the Bible in a real, real, true way. Amen. And I truly believe that there are events yet to come to pass and that will happen. And there will be real people. And if it happens in my lifetime, I want to be ready. And you know what I want to do? I want to do great things for God. Amen. Watch and pray that you might be accounted worthy. What a glorious day would that would be. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your word. We thank you for uh, uh, giving us life and giving us all the opportunities that you've given us, dear Lord. Help us to, to, to strengthen our Christianity, to be ready and prepared for that day. We ask you, dear Lord God, that <coughs> you would bless our church, you'd strengthen us as a church unit, that you would guide us with wisdom and discernment to make the proper decisions in uh, 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 the times to come, whether it be or whether it not be, the, the, the tribulation, dear Lord. We ask you that you'd be with us, dear God, but you would uh, help us to stay alert and aware and awake for that which is to come. We love you so much and keep us safe, dear God, and uh, help us to be accounted worthy. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.